This is a production of Cornell University. Um, so today I'm going to uh, go over some ways that I've been trying to develop an integrated approach to manage weeds. I'm uh, going to go over some examples from my dissertation in which I've tried to do this and then um, get into some of my more current work with the New York State IPM program. I actually want to start off by talking about a weed control failure. This is uh, glyphosate resistant horseweed that has taken over a, a soybean field uh, near Geneva. And this happens when growers repeatedly rely on the same selection pressure, in this case, uh, glyphosate, selecting for uh, those individual weeds that have some tolerance to that selection pressure. Um, and this herbicide resistance has become probably the biggest problem in the field of weed science. Uh, unfortunately, this over-reliance on a single selection pressure does not just apply to conventional growers. Um, actually, from my dissertation, I interviewed four organic vegetable growers that uh, repeatedly rely on the same uh, weed management strategy and have, have kind of selected for a certain uh, cohort of weeds. Uh, in this first example, uh, Mark Guzzi typically relies on a, a strategy in which he controls weeds in the early part of the season when they're, they're most likely to affect yield. Uh, we call this the critical period. And after that period, weeds don't tend to affect yield so much, and so he tends to ignore those weeds. Um, and then when I looked at his, his soil and uh, counted the number of seeds in the soil and what we call the weed seed bank, it turns out that his weed seed bank was really dominated by gallon soga pictured here, which tends to come in later in the season after the critical period and uh, set seed before he is uh, able to harvest. Um, so it's a little bit of a different example that I'm not um, showing uh, a weed that has changed um, or evolved in itself, but rather um, in this selection example, he's kind of selected for a weed that happens to have traits that can allow it to survive his, his consistent selection pressure. Um, another example, uh, Tom Honingford uses a strategy to try to uh, to try to not let any weed produce seeds and thereby not letting those weeds, uh, th their seeds rain down into the ground. Um, he does this by really frequent uh, hoeing or cultivation events. And so when I looked at his, uh, his, his weed seed bank, it was dominated by this weed purslane. I think over 95% of it was purslane. And this is one of the best weeds at surviving hoeing. You, you can actually pull up this weed, cut it into pieces, and a lot of times it will still uh, be able to reroot and um, produce seeds. Uh, Another example, Dave Colson relies on plastic mulch uh, to suppress weeds in his beds, but he oftentimes doesn't control weeds between the beds, and so it's kind of a free-for-all, and it oftentimes results in the most competitive uh, weed, uh, common lambs quarters, a lot of times taking over and producing thousands of weed seeds, and, and that was dominating his weed seed bank. Uh, and then a farmer that relies on hay mulch for most of his crops, um, I, I found uh, had a weed seed bank that was dominated by annual grasses that are able to kind of um, spread out and find some of the weak spots within uh, in, the, in the hay mulch. Um, so with all these examples, uh, I'm just trying to show that 
no single strategy or no single tactic is 100% effective on all weeds. Um, and so what we need to do is to integrate in more weed control tactics to provide more broad spectrum control. And that's the main point of integrated weed management. So I thought, hey, it would be ideal if these growers could rotate between these strategies um, and uh, you know, use each one when it's, when it's gonna be uh, most effective. Um, and so I thought if I could document some of the different benefits and weaknesses of each strategy, then they could kind of use or kind of prescribe each one based on each field or each growing season to get uh, the most benefits from each one. Um, and so I, I actually implemented each strategy in onions and recorded the, the economic and ecological effects. Uh, a lot of the economic effects were related to labor um, and the spread of labor over time, whether it be uh, early in the season or for the critical period throughout the season for zero seed rain, sporadic hand weeding from uh, plastic mulching, um, or require one large uh, mulching event for the hay mulch. Uh, there are also some really interesting ecological trade-offs here. Uh, yield was a little bit reduced in the uh, the light gray bar, the critical period, and I should explain this is a spider plot. So, so each axis is oriented so that as you go to the periphery, um, the the quantity is larger. Um, so yield was a little bit decreased under the critical period strategy. Um, some of the, some of that weed biomass may have. Um, may have affected yield and uh, would definitely uh, make things tricky in the future with all the weed seeds that were produced under this strategy. Uh, black plastic mulch in the dark dotted line had some uh, positive effects on soil, uh, soil quality, but um, it also had decreased uh, soil microbial biomass, which is an, an indicator of soil health. Uh, earthworms were most abundant under the, the hay mulch strategy with all that fodder. And then uh, carabid beetles, which are an important seed predator, uh, were, uh, seemed to prefer the weedy habitat uh, of the critical period plot. Uh, and then insect and disease damage was also greatest in that critical period uh, strategy. So again, there's no overall best strategy here, um, but I'm hoping that organic farmers can, can use this kind of information on the trade-offs to determine which strategy is best for a particular field and um, perhaps rotate between these strategies more often. So that was one part of my dissertation. Uh, the next part that I'm gonna go over was one in which I tried to remove one of the main barriers that is preventing uh, some growers from adopting uh, or integrating in mechanical weed control. So uh, mechanical weed control typically is very effective between the crop rows, but it oftentimes misses the weeds in the row, and, um, and so that's the barrier that I was gonna try to tackle uh, with, with this research. And um, there are some, some tools designed to, to uh, target these in-row weeds, torsion weeders, finger weeders, and tine harrows, uh, but they're typically really lightweight and flexible so that they don't damage the crop, uh, and that unfortunately makes them not very effective at controlling these in-row weeds. Um, but I took a look at one of the, one of a kind of a new breed of cultivators that innovatively allows you to use more than one in-row tool at a time. And I found that, yeah, when you add on more of these in-row tools, you, increase your efficacy, which, which makes sense. Um, you kill more weeds, the more tools you add on. 
Uh, but the really interesting thing to me about this work was that these particular tools in this particular combination interacted in a synergistic way. And um, I can say that because they killed more weeds than you would, have, than you would expect based on the performance of each individual tool. Um, and I think what's going on here is that when you're controlling weeds mechanically, you're either undercutting, uprooting, or burying weeds, and you're, you're doing all three of those with this combination. I think that the, the torsion weeders are undercutting weeds and loosening the soil, which allow the finger weeders to uproot weeds more effectively. And then the harrow really, um, with all that loose soil, buries a lot of weeds at the end. Um, so I was really excited about this synergy and we're getting very high weed control, but the problem here is the crop. <laughs> um, and so uh, we were actually, I, I was killing around 15% of the crop, which is not, which, which is not, ex not acceptable um, you know, to a grower. Brian, is there a video on that somehow that or, or it looks like up on the very top, if there's a video camera looking down, but maybe not. On the back of the harrow? On the back of the harrow. Uh, oh, uh, that's a drop weight that's, that's okay, okay. pushing the, yeah, pushing the harrow down. So, yeah, I, this was an exciting result on the one hand to get this really cool synergistic effect, but I was also taking out a lot of the crop. So, um, when I got to Cornell, I wanted to continue to investigate this synergistic effect, but uh, try to make some changes that would allow for uh, less damage to the crop. And so one of the first things I did was um, uh, switch out the torsion weeders, which I, I think were were uh, undercutting a lot of the crop for some basic sweeps, which are, say, farther away from the crop. I also gave the crop more space between the finger weeders here. And then I took out the, the middle tines on the row harrow to allow the crop to pass through. Uh, I also investigated uh, another tool to do the, the burying part at the very end as, as the last part of the sequence. Uh, this is a, a mini disc hiller and it can actually throw soil into the crop row without necessarily having the metal parts touch the crop. Uh, and then the other change uh, at Cornell Agritech is that we have now a, um, a GPS guided tractor, which um, plants these perfectly straight rows. And then that tractor was used to pull the cultivator as well. And so it was, it was tracking on the same rows that, uh, that I planted on. So I could be very precise with the cultivation. And as a result of those changes, this work was in snap beans. Hey, the, the, the crop mortality here, the beans in red, what really, um, was really minimal. So this was, this was really exciting. But the, um, the mortality of the in-row weeds actually stayed high. Um, and so this was, this is a really ex exciting result for me. Um, and, and again, the most effective combinations or sequences were these three tool sequences down at the bottom. And here's another super slow motion video of uh, one of the sequences that I was really impressed with. The sweeps followed by the fingers, followed by the row harrow. And you can see that it's still it's still aggressively working that in row zone, but it's not, you know, it's not knocking the crop around uh, nearly as much as the previous video. So uh, yeah, so this was um, a, a good result and um, But I wanted to, you know, so what, one of the things with this particular trial is that it was really in ideal conditions. The, the beans were well established. They were at least six inches tall, whereas the weeds were less than one inch tall. 
So it, it, was, it was an ideal situation for this tool to work. So to really put this tool through the paces, I wanted to test it in a crop that is slower to establish, is more slower growing, in a situation where the weeds are right up around the same size as the crop. Uh, and so for that, for that, I chose beets and um, did several, a, a couple trials. So one in, in the two leaf stage and then uh, one trial in four leaf stage beets. And you can see in the, in the red here that the crop mortality of the two leaf stage was unacceptable, uh, killing around half the crop in, in some of these treatments. Uh, but if I waited until the four leaf stage, crop mortality was, was reduced to an acceptable level, um, especially for this particular combination of the sweeps finger disc killer. Um, and so this is just a photo showing one of the, one of the few surviving beats from the two leaf stage uh, compared to the four leaf stage in which the crop uh, survived that, that physical disturbance fairly well um, and I think was tall enough in its, in its morphology to allow in that, all that soil to bury some of the lower growing weeds while it, it remained above uh, all that disturbance. So uh, some of the impacts of this work include that there's now uh, more companies uh, carrying stacked cool tool combinations like uh, this company called Tillmore that has a, a small scale model, a walk behind model. Um, and there's some larger companies as well, um, or larger tools. Uh, some growers aren't necessarily uh, shelling out the money for, for these new tools. They're just retrofitting their existing cultivator by adding on parts that they happen to have and have reported that it has really improved the effectiveness. Um, so that's, that's kind of the... That was the early thrust of my work uh, with New York State IPM and uh, gave a lot of uh, talks and some demonstrations about, about this work. Um, and really, I found that the demonstrations are a lot better. The farmers, farmers especially learn better from demonstrations and hands-on type learning rather than being lectured at. Um, and so, uh, for the next part, I'm going to talk about some demonstrations that I did, and which I actually focused on practices or, or tactics that I thought are, are currently underutilized in New York. And so one of the first ones was of solarization, which is uh, the use of clear plastic to superheat the soil and uh, kill weeds and potentially weed seeds. Uh, and in this uh, demonstration in which I uh, worked alongside Brian Eschenauer and, and Betsy Lamb, um, we demonstrated the solarization plot and right next door had a control plot. And in each one, we buried uh, temperature loggers about two inches deep in the soil and found that, hey, solarization increased the soil temperature at two inch depth up into the 120s. And that's high enough to actually kill some weed seeds. So, um, and, and, and uh, there have been similar results up in Maine. And so this is really exciting because solarization is typically used in California and Israel and, and, and hotter and sunnier locations. Um, yeah, so I think that growers, growers can start to use solarization in New York to target their weed seed bank and try to deplete the number of seeds in the soil. Uh, the next demo I want to talk about was in greenhouses for um, container production. And one of the, or I guess several of the more problematic weeds in container production uh, include uh, wood sorrel here, liverwort, and uh, oriental bittergrass, and several of these have the ability to actually eject seeds from their mature seed pods up to five or six feet away, and they can land, they can go from the, from the ground up into the pots on the bench. Um, 
And so uh, uh, Brian Eschenauer and I had seen some research from the USDA looking at, at rice hulls, uh, kind of a byproduct of, of rice processing, uh, to use as a mulch. And um, the USDA had some initially kind of uh, encouraging results from that. And so we looked at um, several different rates uh, from zero to a quarter inch, half inch, and three quarter inch, and found that, yeah, the, um, the, the half inch to three quarter inch uh, rates did really effectively prevent uh, these, these seeds from establishing, even when we had, had hand, uh, hand sown them. Um, and there's actually several growers in New York that have adopted this practice. Okay, the next demonstration I want to talk about is of controlling bindweed in, in grapes. And, you know, grapes are, um, they're a perennial, uh, they're a, a vining crop, and the growers have put all this effort in to make these trellises. And it turns out that perennial vining weeds really appreciate all that effort, uh, especially bindweed. And um, so, uh, and uh, growers a lot of time re rely on glyphosate to control bindweed sprayed in either the fall or the spring. But unfortunately, that's not the most effective time to control bindweed with a systemic herbicide. Uh, more effective would be mid or late summer. Uh, and so Hans Walter Peterson, Don Caldwell, and I evaluated several treatments uh, sprayed or, or, or implemented midsummer. So glyphosate kind of as a standard, as well as uh, rim sulfuron, a group two herbicide, cultivation and untreated control, and found that, uh, yes, uh, all three of these treatments were, were uh, very effective at controlling the, the hedge bindweed. Um, and in particular, these two treatments could have a bit of a, a benefit in that they did not uh, cause any visible injury to the grapes, whereas the glyphosate did, as shown here. Okay, so uh, the final story I'm going to tell today is is uh, about, I guess, probably my, my biggest project so far with New York State IPM, and that's in trying to find ways to control herbicide-resistant weeds in corn and soybean systems. Um, here I'm holding up water hemp, which uh, is only on maybe a dozen farms in New York right now, but it has growers, I think, more worried than, um, than the other herbicide resistant weed I pictured earlier, uh, horseweed, because water hemp is much more competitive. Um, and uh, so we're working with, with most of these growers to try to contain water hemp because its seed actually just falls straight to the ground, unlike horseweed, which is windblown, windblown seed and is everywhere. Um, and the growers wanted to know, well, which herbicides exactly is water hemp uh, resistant to? And so uh, they sent me some, some seed samples and I, I gathered more seed from other extension educators and um, actually grew out those seeds in, uh, in the greenhouse. This is in uh, Tony Di Tommaso's uh, greenhouse. And then with help of his, uh, his uh, research associates, uh, Kathy Howard and Scott Morris, we actually sprayed several different herbicides on these weeds um, to determine if they were resistant or not. And the way we did that was uh, spray several different doses um, of each herbicide to get this dose response curve. And we not only sprayed uh, the, the population that we thought might be resistant, but um, I, I called over to a colleague in Canada and got some susceptible uh, water hemp that, that we knew was susceptible to these herbicides. And so if the two curves end up being different, then you can say that this population is, is resistant. Um, and so we tested glyphosate, we tested atrazine, we tested uh, imazlipir and, um, and lactofen. 
And it turned out that, that we likely have resistance from uh, glyphosate, from atrazine, and imazepir, but the lactofen was, was still effective. Um, so that was some good news for the growers. Um, and the next part was to actually test these herbicides and some more integrated treatments out in the field. Uh, as many of you probably know, conditions are a little different and, and processes work differently out in the field than in the greenhouse a lot of times. Um, and so uh, the first part, or for the first set of trials, uh, which was in soybeans, um, I looked at several different herbicides and I've replaced the names with just their, their site of action. Um, what group number the herbicides are in, which is generally how they work. Um, so group two, this is um, this was the uh, the um, this was the imazepir, and then the atrazine or ametribuzin, but another group five, and then uh, two other different herbicide groups represented. Just single herbicides here used pre-emergence. So this is applied right at planting and these herbicides are primarily acting on the germinating weed seeds. Uh, they don't have as much activity on, on necessarily on the emerged plants. Um, and yeah, this, this trial generally backed up the greenhouse results in that group two, the imazepir, and then group five um, were not effective on controlling the water. Um, but the next thing I did was, you know, so these treatments here are not really representative of what a grower would actually do. So I included some treatments that were more representative um, of, of a 100% pre-only program, a post-only program. So these are, this is sprayed mid-season on the emerged weeds, and then a pre and a post. This is, these are called two-pass programs. And uh, the final four here are actually kind of rare right now in New York. Most growers want to control all of their weeds in one fell swoop. They don't want to have to drive through the field twice. Um, so, so these are kind of my kitchen sink approaches because we didn't know how, how difficult it would be to control this water hemp. And so in the, in the contrast over here, you can see generally that the, the two pass system was more effective than the pre only or the post only, which makes sense. Uh, one thing that the growers are typically really interested in is, is how much do things cost? And as some background, right now, a lot of growers are paying between 10 and $20 an acre for weed control maybe even less than $10 an acre in some cases. So that some of these are getting up to $75 an acre. That is, that's quite an increase, uh, especially when you consider that soybean growers are grossing four to $500 an acre. So say $400 an acre, $75 out of that on weed control is quite a, a, uh, a big chunk. Um, but it might be worth it actually, because water hemp has seed that is fairly short lived in the soil. Uh, most of it will become inviable or will have germinated after four years. So it might be worth it for a grower to you know, go with this really, you know, the kitchen sink approach here, spend the money for four years, um, deplete that water hemp from the soil and then perhaps scale back to a more affordable weed control system. Otherwise, you know, say the grower was getting 97%, that's still potentially several, uh, maybe 10 or 20 weeds per acre going to seed, producing thousands of seed and perpetuating the problem. So they may have to spend $66 an acre every year um, rather than for just a few years. So that's just something to consider. Um, and the other aspect of the trial was in corn. Um, I set up a similar trial looking first at individual herbicides. Again, these are just their group numbers. Um, group two and five were the, the ones that we um, found resistance to in the greenhouse. And once again, group two was, was not 
uh, not effective in controlling the water hemp, but group five this time was. Um, and I think part of that is just due to the crop. The corn is a more competitive crop, and so control is a little bit easier. Um, and then with the full, more realistic treatments that a grower might actually conduct, um, uh, once again, pre-only versus post-only, uh, post and then two-pass systems. And this time, actually, the, the pre by themselves um, was more effective than post programs alone. Um, and then I was particularly excited to see some of the integrated treatments perform really well. So especially this system here, uh, you know, just one herbicide, row cultivation, and then interseeding controlled 100% of the water hemp. Uh, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with interseeding, it's kind of a hot new topic for uh, or, or way for corn growers to um, incorporate cover cropping into their production. Um, driving around here, there's still a lot of corn even right now that hasn't been harvested yet. So for a grower to try to plant a cover crop after corn is really challenging. Um, so the interseeding allows you to, to come in and plant this cover crop when the corn is maybe a, a foot or two tall. The cover crop slowly establishes over the course of the season and then when the corn dries down and then of course when you harvest it, the cover crop um, really takes off. And so this is, this is a really great practice for, you know, for soil health and, and soil quality. Um, and I wanted to make sure that if growers are using more herbicides, especially residual herbicides, the pre-programs that, that act on the weed seeds, um, that, this wouldn't, that those herbicides wouldn't prevent you from doing interseeding. So what I did was test several different pre-emergence programs um, and then um, followed by a post-emergence uh, application that would not have any residual effect on the seeds and then planted annual ryegrass as interseeded cover crop. Um, and it came back in September, measured the annual ryegrass biomass, and so any reductions here um, are likely due to the residual herbicide, uh, I guess ex except in the case of the untreated control in which the cover crop was competing with weeds. Um, but so the, the overall effect was that, or the overall message is that um, those herbicides that have grass weed activity um, did tend to injure the ryegrass. Um, but those that didn't, like group 27 especially, this is Callisto, did not injure the ryegrass. And so I would suggest those herbicides, if growers are looking to do interseeding, as well as control these, these uh, broadleaf water hemp and um, horseweed. Um, one kind of interesting anecdote about this that I'm, I'm gonna uh, be replicating this next year and take a closer look at is this potential effect here of the row cultivation to lessen the effect of the, of the residual herbicide. Um, I think that it, it, it kind of makes sense in that the row cultivation would break up the soil and help the, the, um, the residual herbicide to degrade a little bit faster so that it wouldn't have as, as much of an injury potential on the cover crop. So in these, these field days, I've demonstrated interseeding, cultivation, different herbicide programs, uh, but what do the growers think about this? Uh, are, they, are they gonna change at all as a result of these field days? Well, one thing I'm, I'm getting better at is documenting my impact. And um, a good way to do that is by handing out evaluations at the end of field days, asking very pointed questions. As a result of this program, that's the pointed part, which practices will you increase in the next few years? And the results were, were encouraging, actually. 27% um, of the growers um, are likely going to be um, trying out two pass programs. 34% um, are interested in using several different herbicide modes of action, and that's that's kind of a basic first step. 
Uh, not very many were interested in the row cultivation. I think uh, among large scale field crop growers, it has kind of a, um, a stigma or, or uh, perception as being really slow and that you're not gonna cover the acreage. Um, but I'm working on changing that perception that some of the newer cultivators are very fast. Um, 11% interested in interseeding, and then this was a surprise, 17% interested in, in cleaning weed seeds from equipment. And it was a surprise because we didn't, we didn't really talk about this in our programming at all. It was, this was, uh, well, other than the fact that after the growers left the field days, they had to clean their boots really well. And we gave them brushes and everything and made them sit down so they weren't spreading soil that would contain these, these weed seeds. Um, so yeah, I think the growers are seeing you know, cleaning as a potentially low cost way to prevent the spread of these weeds. Uh, one other part of the project, and this, this was kind of a fun part for me, uh, was demonstrating a, a weed zapper, a tool that was designed uh, for use in soybeans. It, and it's actually an electrified rod that runs over the top of the crop and electrocutes any weeds that it comes in contact with. And this, this is particularly um, uh, applicable to herbicide resistant weeds. Horseweed here tends to shoot up high above uh, the soybeans, as does uh, water hemp and some of our other problem weeds. Um, and so this was particularly effective on those weeds and I'll hopefully be looking into this more uh, next year, uh, along with Lynn Sosnowski uh, in a potential farm viability project. Um, looking to the future and, and uh, something that I'd like to change a little bit as for next year's trials is to investigate the use of rye mulch um, to suppress weeds. And this is something that Matt Ryan has done a lot of work with um, and uh, or in organic systems, a great way to, um, and in conventional for the, as well, but without herbicides, a good way to uh, terminate this rye before planting the soybeans into it is with a roller crimper. Um, and in, in some of uh, Matt's trials and uh, Sarah Pethybridge's trials that they brought me in on, uh, I was really impressed with how well the rolled rye suppressed weeds. And I think with our herbicide resistant weeds, it's gonna be even more effective actually, because both of our herbicide resistant weeds, horseweed and, um, and water hemp are two primary ones. They have tiny seeds, minuscule, and they, they have very little energy stored inside them to push through much residue at all. Horseweed has to, I mean, when it emerges from the soil, it's typically in less than a quarter inch of soil. Um, so I'm hopeful that you know, if I can try this next year, it'll be effective on these herbicide resistant weeds. And uh, the other exciting part of this, of this rye is that uh, Sarah Pethybridge found that it, it suppressed white mold, which is one of the primary pathogens of soybeans, suppressed white mold by about 80%. So, rolled rye, I mean, it's a cover crop. It's got great soil health uh, implications, good um, potential to control other pests or pathogens with the rolled rye. And I'd like to see if it can control our herbicide resistant weeds as well. So this is exactly the kind of integrated uh, type approach that, that I want to be um, demonstrating and um, you know, promoting. Um, just to, to sum things up, um, I've, I've gone over a number of examples of ways that, that integrating different herbicides and different tactics is necessary to be, to be most effective in, in weed control. Um, but a lot of times those, those tactics require more knowledge of the ecology of the system. They can be more expensive. And so to overcome uh, those challenges, it really helps, I think, if the alternative tactics also satisfy other management goals, like the rolled rye system that has 
multiple benefits for farms. Um, uh, and with that, I want to thank New York Farm Viability Institute for uh, funding the corn and soybean work, um, USDA NIFA for um, the cultivation research, Northeast SARE for the systems comparison, and then the Lake Erie Regional Grape Research and Extension Program, and New York Wine and Grape Foundation for the, the bindweed control uh, research. And I'll take any questions. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in the uh, rice hull on containers because I've seen this growers everywhere using rice hulls. Really? And uh, I mean, is it just a suppression, a light suppression, or is it some kind of chemical mm. suppression? Because this is happening all over the place. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so the question for people online is, is how does the rice hull mulch work? Um, and what are the what's the mechanism I guess and from what I've read it sounds like the rice hull mulch is just so dry it, even after it's watered um, it's so light and dries out so quickly that it doesn't provide a kind of a safe site for seeds to germinate so you have to do it after everything's clean yeah I mean if you put it on in the spring before many weeds and weeds were growing the weeds might be in the soil and if you put it on top of that. Right, yeah. Um, we didn't test whether or not the rice hull mulch would suppress existing weeds in the soil. Um, weed seeds. Weed seeds, yeah. Um, we we um, applied the mulch and then sprinkled the seeds on top as if they had just been, yeah. you know, shot from the plant, um, which at the time it sounded like the more, uh, the more common way that well, the, the weeds. Well, I think a lot of growers who are just have plants in, in containers. Mm. They're not cleaning everything off and putting. Mm. They're actually just putting it on top. Yeah. Really yeah. So I, I suppose it would be more applicable for annual plants, in which you're starting with clean, usually clean uh, potting mix. And I'm seeing this with woody plants too. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I was wondering if there's like a willow path, like a red or something. Yeah, it could be. Um, from from what I read from the USDA's trial, uh, they were indicating that the primary mechanism was the drying. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Betsy. Do you know how, um, where the water hemp came in or how the water hemp came into New York? Yeah, um, the water hemp came in um, likely, well, for several of the farms, um, uh, based on how it came into their um, their kind of tractor storage area um, and how that coincided with how they recently purchased used equipment from the Midwest, um, I think that's probably the likely scenario. Other times it can come in on contaminated seed or um, more commonly on contaminated bedding if it's a dairy farm, um, if they're getting, you know, uh, feather meal or or other types of you know um, inputs like that from other states. So I was thinking yeah. in terms of the concept of if you've got it, then you do this for four years with you know the intense practices. Mm. Then you don't have to worry about it again. Mm -hmm. It's only true if it's if it's not coming right. In, an easy access in. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, Brian. For many years, there's been a weed suppression or weed killing technique of a flame. Mm. Uh, have you experimented with those at all? And if so, have you seen if they have any uh, true value? Yeah, uh, good question, Don. So, uh, have I? Do I have experience with the, um, a flame weeder? And I haven't personally done research with the flame weeder. I have used one, um, but yeah, they're very effective. I mean, you're 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 burning the um, the existing vegetation of the plant. Um, in some cases, although the manufacturers suggest and some research suggests that you only need to pass by just fast enough to rupture some of the cells in the plant so that when you squeeze the leaf, your, your thumb leaves a mark. And that indicates that you've done enough damage that the plant will likely die. Um, yeah, flame weeding is um, really effective on um, annual broadleaf weeds. It's not quite as effective on um, grass weeds because their growing point, their 
you know, their meristematic tissue is kind of protected and lower. And then of course, perennials, it's not as effective on either. Yeah. Yeah, Lynn. So when you did your, your soy and your corn herbicide works, when you had your, your two pass, you had a group four and a group nine together. What was your group four herbicide? A dicamba. I was curious, so they're seeing a lot of volatility now with tank mix combinations, and they think uh, with glyphosate dropping the pH and causing mm. off-target movement. Mm. Do you think you're seeing any of that, or do you still feel New York's conditions are still safe for that combination? Oh, that's a good question, Lynn. Yeah, so dicamba, dicamba and has been in the news a lot for volatility, and, and growers are concerned, especially in areas that are near grapes that are extremely sensitive to group four uh, synthetic auxins in general, um, that, um, yeah, we need to be really careful about, um, about applying group four herbicides according to the label. Um, and I, I hadn't actually seen that, um, uh, what you mentioned about the glyphosate lowering the pH and potentially increasing the volatility. Um, do you know if that hasn't made it to the label yet? Has it any restrictions on that? Uh, it's about, Tennessee's been seeing a lot of uh, off-target movement and they think mm. it's, it's, it's in response to this, this uh, in these dank mix combinations. I was just wondering if, uh, you, if, if in your research, if you feel you've seen any enhanced volatility or not. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, it's, it's so, you know, it's, it's, it's an invisible, um, you know, I didn't receive any calls the day after, <laughs> um, but we were spraying on such small plots that, that we wouldn't have seen it for the trial. Um, I'm sure we have had some dicamba injury though in New York from, from volatilized applications. And um, I believe there's, there's resources online if, if grape growers feel like they have some injury to the grapes that they can document that and try to narrow down, was there a farm in the vicinity that was spraying and during a certain time and potentially they could, they could get a, a payment um, to reimburse them for the damage. Brian, before we wrap yeah. up, can you just ask Geneva if there are any questions? Uh, yeah, any questions from Geneva? Do I have to do anything on here? I think so. No, we're, we're all set. Thank you. They're all set. Okay. Set. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Brian. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.